Thank you. So um, I, I had to come up with something overnight and I thought probably the most appropriate thing to come up with was a discussion about why are we talking about stakeholders with an actual stake in the first place? What's interesting about this topic and um, how did we get to this point? So in my world uh, view as a child born in the late 70s, growing up in the 80s, technology was a very amazing thing because we started off getting chat rooms in the internet in 1996 and we started doing SMSs and MMSs on our old Nokia phones. And it changed the way that communication happened so that it could rapidly happen in a digital environment and we could organise parties much quicker than the, uh, our parents' generation. And that enabled us to do that organisation of parties much quicker than our parents' generation. And it's not just, uh, you know, late teenage, early adults who were using technology to aggregate around messages and to send messages in a disaggregated fashion. Uh, adults were doing it too. So I started to see uh, crowdfunding emerge from about, and I think we all did, um, from late 2010, 2011, Posible in Australia really started to kick off the crowdfunding, uh, uh, in rewards at least, rewards crowdfunding space. And for me that was uh, fascinating. And, and what I found was that the sense of ownership that somebody who may have put $50 into a project or somebody who put $500 into a project wasn't represented by a 10x number of votes. Like the person who put in $500 wanted the person who put in $50 to have a vote that was equal to their vote. They didn't want their vote to be worth 10 times somebody else's vote. And so it was interesting that the capital that was being accumulated around crowdfunding was more interested in each individual member of the crowd and their participation than the dollars that they were investing buying them sway. And so my light bulb moment um, uh, in 2012 was when uh, the Corporates and Markets Advisory Commission, CAMAT, put out its first industry submission for how should we do equity, what they call crowdsourced equity funding in Australia. And my argument uh, back in 2012 and, and for the last eight years has been that the natural home for equity crowdfunding is member owned rather than capital owned, where every member has the same vote and where it's their pooled resources, not just the financial resources, but their time, their networks, their effort and their energy that could make equity crowdfunding really interesting because groups could get together in a democratic and participative way and using that technology which we'd been using to organize parties they could buy for themselves the assets that they would share and get benefit from and that they would want to manage those democratically because those assets are ones that they're likely to all use so the next question for me came up around 2014, which was, well, how do you use, you know, instead of giving lip service, and uh, I've been guilty of this myself, uh, I think most of us have been in jobs where this has been evident, where that they will, with a straight face, say that, you know, employees are our greatest asset. But the reality of it is they see employees as the greatest liability, the biggest line item on the balance sheet. And when push comes to shove, you know, it's easier to get rid of employees uh, preemptively and to continue to show budget than it is to support your employees through a downturn, engage with those employees and help them uh, to help you through the recovery period of your business. And so we see with employees a lot of lip service about you're our greatest asset when in truth the management was treating them like the greatest liability. 
and you'll see it with uh, the lip service given to customers. So one of the things that I love so much about cooperatives is that their customers are their members and their members are their owners and there's an alignment there. But you often hear companies saying that customers are our most valuable asset, you know, and we listen to our customers and we have to respond to the customer and they're the one that we are responding to. Where in reality, uh, customers are seen as they've got their, your money in their pocket and your job as a business owner is to work out the method to take money from their pocket and put it into yours. So the real cynicism about customer service, whilst you're busy raising prices, lowering services, offshoring, outsourcing, anything to make profit maximisation the goal. So we started to wonder if you gave employees, customers, uh, suppliers, ownership of the enterprise, what would change? Uh, bear with me for a second. Um, Sorry. So how can we incentivize uh, uh, the different stakeholders of employees and customers and providers and suppliers such that uh, they're going to stay with us, they're going to be more loyal, they're going to give their spend, they're going to volunteer market research to make product development better. They're going to be your best form of marketing, word of mouth marketing, member getting member. So where we saw that sort of uh, ownership can give stakeholders uh, engagement, it can give them uh, the business you know, better governance, better day or change day-to-day -day operations and changed engagement with our stakeholders and that can lead to improved performance. We start to understand that a enterprise where we're not giving lip service to stakeholders but where those stakeholders are actively engaged, it will be ferocious. You can put company A offering a product and cooperative B offering the same product. And if they're in market with the same product, uh, cooperative B is so much more appealing because as a customer, I'm getting a vote, I'm going to be heard, I am a member, I elect the board. If there are distributions, they're coming back to me for my customership. And uh, this means that cooperatives, uh, sometimes suffering from a, a self-image issue, are actually the most voracious or vicious entity in the marketplace, yet they yield to the corporation, which shows to shareholders the profit every year, when if they showed to all of their stakeholders the impact and the profits that they were able to generate. They could be more capitalist than capitalism, and achieve greater market shares than corporations in the same market with the same product. One of the most uh, interesting applications of where you give stakeholders an actual stake is in local economic development. Uh, so community ownership of uh, breweries is massive. So we set up a cooperative uh, uh, boutique uh, craft brewing company in, oh, cooperative in the Macedon Ranges. Uh, it was one of three cooperative breweries set up in 2019. Uh, now that's people gathering around beer, but likewise, we found them gathering around really essential services. So Barossa Valley, uh, which has 30% uh, of its households already had rooftop solar. We're interested in creating a renewable energy cooperative so that on the scout hall and the public utility buildings, they could fund as a community solar projects that would go on community businesses. And these would give a financial return to the community, give lower energy prices to the scouts, and overall, all the benefits were flowing back to the community. Another example of this is procurement. And we're gonna have the opportunity of hearing from Mark Daniels later today He'll talk about uh, procurement and its effect on local economies. But there is this uh, well-publicised global uh, model called the Preston model, 
which used procurement, i.e. a diversion of procurement funds uh, from the universities, the hospitals, the large organisations in a town, this council in a town, and puts a favourable weighting when those organisations are procuring to locally owned worker cooperatives. So procurement coupled with worker owned uh, cooperatives was able to shift the dial in terms of local economic development far more than uh, encouraging a large corporation to establish their manufacturing facility within a council area and bring jobs to the area. So going deep and going wide within the community rather than trying to import uh, economic activity has shown to improve the outcomes for uh, locals and communities in the area. The last uh, thing where I think stakeholders having an actual stake is really fertile ground and, and one of the reasons that we're exploring it is that, you know, of the million ABNs uh, that have been issued in Australia, um, you know, about 4,000 of them will get a trade sale in any given year. And maybe a couple of dozen of them in any given year will have an exit onto a public market via IPO. So all of the business activity in the economy basically has two ways of being realised for founders and investors. And that is either through the IPO or the trade sale. I believe that a third uh, option exists for uh, exit for founders and investors, and that comes with giving stakeholders an actual stake. And that is where you exit to the community, the employees, the customers, the locals, the suppliers, uh, in some cases, the public-private partnerships. And founders and investors can get a return as they sell their shares to the stakeholders who will, with an actual stake, be more loyal and more likely to take that business sustainably forward. Um, that, I think, it represents a huge economic activity. It solves a problem for succession for a lot of businesses. And it's one of the reasons that we should be exploring why giving stakeholders an actual stake is really important. It doesn't have to be that stakeholders buy out investors and founders in a singular acquisition. It could be staged, you know, every five years, another portion of that business exits from founders and investors to the communities. Or it could be built in as a customer loyalty program so that as suppliers supply, as customers buy, as employees show the behaviours that the organisation wants, they earn points, points equals ownership, and they acquire the business through their activity with the business and at the same time provide an exit to founders and investors. There's some of the reasons that I've been such an advocate for uh, stakeholders having an actual stake. We can change the way we fund things so that we get the things we want. We can change the behaviours of stakeholders. We can utilise the technology that kids are using these days to, to create parties, to create meaningful things. Those meaningful things in our local economic environment will help us be in a good economic neighbourhood and help us be good economic neighbours and help us be more resilient in a changing climate. And finally, we will have an opportunity of changing essentially the oligarchy of exits from IPO or trade sale to enabling communities to be involved in a meaningful and actual way with the organisations that they spend their money with or spend their time with. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and you get to see more uh, examples of stakeholders with an actual stake.